like to call to order the December 7th, 2017 business meeting and ask uh, our county administrator to, Don Krupp, please take a roll. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have uh, Mr. Stephen Madcor here, County Council, and uh, serving as clerk of the board today is Mr. Kevin Moss. So I'll start uh, with the roll. Commissioner Humberston? Here. Commissioner Fisher? Here. Commissioner Schrader? Here. Chair Bernard? Here. And Commissioner Savas is attending uh, another meeting and will not be in attendance today. I actually told me he might be late, but we'll see. Uh, with that, we'll move on to citizen communications. Oh, oh wait, flag. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I guess we had to put that in bigger print. It's not like I've never done it before. All right, now we're on to citizen communication. We have Rob Reynolds and Kevin Johnson up first. Yeah, just both of you come on up, tell us who you are and what you'd like to talk to us about. Rob? Uh, my name is Rob Reynolds. Uh, I'm a congressional candidate for the U.S. 5th District. Uh, the reason I'm here is not just to introduce myself, but I really want to talk about the Westland paper mill and uh, saving the 260 jobs that are there, and we are going to need your help to do it. So that's why I'm here. Okay. Yeah, and we'd like to help. <laughs> There's uh, the Westland Paper Mill has a lot of opportunities. Uh, we've, I think, all of us have maybe toured mm -hmm. the Westland Paper Mill. I I still need to tour it. Oh. We're going to have a a group of women from our circle of local elected women, and we're going to go as a group to go tour the Westland Paper Mill. I've done it at least two or three times. Okay, well, you don't have to come with us then. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, did, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Or? Oh, I did. I thought I had, like, sorry, didn't know I was. Oh, you got three minutes. <laughs> okay, I'm um, sorry. I spoke with uh, uh, the mill manager uh, last week, and he has a plan set up after they finish their bankruptcy next year to. Uh, reopen the plant. But the issues are um, overhead. The property tax, the $500,000 a year that he spends on property tax is huge. Uh, the property is not valued at what it's stated at. That needs to be reevaluated. I wanted to see if there's a way for the county to um, remove or adjust the fees for ADA upgrades that are needed for the mill so that he can use some of the other buildings to increase his revenue to cover some uh, reduces overhead. So there's some options available. He'd also like to look at uh, connecting with uh, Clackamas Community College to provide training. So there's just some huge options that are available besides the fact that starting wage there is $21 an hour. So that's living wage. Top wage is $35 an hour. These are mill rights, these are electricians, these are painters, plumbers. This is what we're looking for in our community to have uh, this type of workers available and training, and he trains all his staff, so you know they can come in straight from high school or two years out of high school or whatever, and he will train them and get them certified to do these jobs. The fact is that with overhead being so high, because partially because of property tax, but also partially because of you know uh, buying pulp from Canada, there are issues that are available or issues that are happening. What I'd like to see is the county step up and try and help save these jobs. That's 260 jobs. You know, we've, the county stepped up and says, oh, well, we're training these people. But I don't know if you've ever gone through retraining. When you're 35 or 40 years old, you've done a job for 20 years, and then all of a sudden they want to retrain you to do something else. You're not going to be retrained to, to do a job that can pay you the same as what you were making. So, you know, if the county can step up in some way to help with the uh, permit fees or property tax, or just other fees that are out there for them to reopen. That would be amazing. That would be the you know what what they're looking for, what Brian's looking for down there, and what I'd like to help do in any way to connect the business market with the county and with the mill to make this happen. So yeah. that's why I'm here. It's just to well, ADA is a federal requirement, so right. there's not much we can do about that. Well, so. building permits, though. I mean, because well, when they're upgrading, when they're because they need to upgrade the ramps and stuff to some of their buildings at the uh, south end of the the island, mm -hmm. they have they have buildings on there that could be rented out, but they're not ADA um, permitted, 
and you know you're going to have to have building permits to do all the work to make that happen. So if there was a way to you know reduce the fees to make that happen, so they could make have other income coming in. You know, they also want would like to put in you know lookout area there at the south end of the island uh, by the falls. There's a beautiful area down there that would be amazing for people to, be able to walk out on and look at the falls. And uh, the mill manager is more than willing to do that. So. Yeah. Well, one thing he told me is that oftentimes he'll train an electrician and somebody will steal them. Right. Because there's such a shortage of uh, right of work workers. Ken. Well, my suggestion would be to uh, have the uh, general manager meet with our Economic Development Commission and see if we can put together a plan um, and bring some of our other resources in that uh, might be able to come up with a plan that could be worked on. Okay. Um, can I get the information to take back to him to make that happen? If you so in Mr. fact, I, yeah, I believe our economic development staff have actually reached out to uh, to, to, ah, the, uh, okay. to the mill Good. Uh, already. I w will say this, the, um, the building permitting responsibilities and decision making regarding uh, accessibility and ADA is actually the responsibility of the city of Westland because it lies within the city of uh, Westland's jurisdiction. The county is not involved with the uh, building permit and um, sort of regulatory requirements there that uh, apply to them. But I, um, I, I do believe as well our, our workforce folks have also uh, connected up with, uh, with uh, uh, paper mill folks as well. So we're, we're doing our best to try to uh, help and uh, I, I certainly think we would support any kind of effort um, that it would take to try to keep the mill open. So. Yeah. Well, I serve on the local workforce board, so uh, there's a ra rapid response team that works with our economic development team here, business and community services, with the workforce board that when you have something of this magnitude happen with layoffs, and I understand it would be great to keep the jobs there, and I don't think anybody would argue with that, but in, in those kinds of situations, it, it immediately kicks in, and they immediately have the workforce teams and professionals, which are just down the road here, and our economic development team uh, move to start uh, you know, assessing, uh, looking at retraining, and really getting all the ducks in a row to make sure that the people who have been employed, who suddenly are unemployed, have an opportunity to find employment. See, but that's the problem. It's not retraining that we need to work on. We need to work on saving the mill. Right. And I understand the that. rapid response. Yes, they're great. They, I, I met with them already. Um, they're awesome. They do a great job. That's not the question. Is how do we save these jobs? How do we keep this mill in Westland? That's that's the important point. 260 jobs is you know 20 million dollars a year in salary. Um, you know, besides the four times that amount of the other businesses that are affected because of the mill um, closing down. Right, so and, and I agree, actually. I would prefer to keep those jobs, and I would prefer to see if something can be done to keep those jobs, but in the event that that doesn't happen, right. there's there's least, uh, what I'm just trying to say right. is that, I'm not disagreeing with you about keeping the jobs, but I think uh, if, if it happens that it doesn't get there, there is a process in place to at least try and make sure that people get Right, and, yeah, and um, everybody employed. greatly appreciates that. I mean, I'm not arguing that point. I just, I just would like to make sure that the county is is doing everything they can to try and save these jobs. And that wasn't the impression I received um, from the research I've done. So that's why I'm here is just to, you know, ask that everything is being done possible to save these jobs. So that's and that's all I'm here to say. Of course, we have lots of businesses that struggle and go out of business that it would be difficult for us to excuse their property taxes um, when we don't do it to other people. I mean, I had a small business and my property taxes were, in Clackamas County, are so much better than Portland. Right. But I couldn't even imagine asking the county to reduce my taxes so I can stay in business. So I don't know. I. I the, I'll, I'll tell you the best opportunity there is using portions of that property, like you said, out on the south end uh, would be a great brew pub, pub uh, great housing opportunity, much better than the Blue Heron side as far right. as I'm concerned, and uh, actually a motivated property owner and developer. So uh, I'm very interested. I've met with them before too, right. and so we're, we're we're certainly open to sit down, talk to them, see how we can keep the jobs. 
My, my other fear is, is, is that it's going to end up like the Blue Heron paper mill. Um, I've lived in Oregon City the last seven years of my life, and seeing the destruction of that mill or the waste of it and seeing the jobs go away and nothing happen with it. I know there's a plan, but nothing's happening with it, and I just don't want to see that happen to the other side of the river. So that's, you know. Yeah. Don't hold your breath. <laughs> well, I know. I, that's, why, that's why I'm here, though. I'm trying to make something happen, you know, it just, just uh, let you know that there's uh, people out there that are trying to make, make something happen, so. Mr. Johnson. Good morning. <clears throat> Hoping to get some answers and clarification on, co on comments made at the last two meetings. Let's start with Ken blaming corporations for people not being able to afford housing. Is it small corporations, big corporations, or all corporations? <clears throat> if I can get a show of hands, how many of you have a retirement plan? Mm -hmm. Unless you've opted out, at the very least, you're in the PERS plan. And I think most of that fund is in the stock market, corporation stocks. Directors of corporations have a fiduciary responsibility to try and make money for their stockholders. Do you really expect them to believe that you don't want their stocks to do well? And you'd gladly pay two more dollars for a hamburger, even, it af even if it affects tens of millions of Americans. Slamming corporations is shameful, especially with no solution for the problem you see. If corporations are so ev evil, you should divest all your stocks. Maybe put the money in rental property. Good luck, good luck with that when rent control comes. Now let's talk about the Holcomb property. I heard it was the best plan staff can come up with. For that to be true, you'd have to believe they were telling you the truth. It may be true, but do they really know? I'll give you a couple of examples to make my point. The H3S director, your head guy, sat here two weeks ago and told, and, and told you how terrible the sewer backup was and hazmat had to be called. He also said the only way to fix the problem was to move all the residents out and replace all the sewer lines. The true story turns out to be a problem with Oregon City pipes, nothing to do with anything on the county site and maintenance staff cleaned the units. Later he said the units were first occupied in 1962, but they were only intended to last into the 90s. Built in the 60s and only a 30 year lifespan? That's just ignorant and, and or knowingly a lie. Martha, you said before Thanksgiving you were thankful to have a cozy and warm home. When was it built? I think Clackamas Heights down the road is 20 years older, and if I remember correctly, they aren't even on foundations. With the director's logic, how could they possibly still be functional? Saying these things, I would have trouble believing he was telling the truth about any of it. You say the property has to be sold to build more units. Exactly what are the proceeds going to be used for? How much county money is going into the PEDCOR property project? I also know how Ken, I, I also like to know how Ken came up with a $1,000 a door cost per year. Is that the PEDCOR property or is that for current housing authority units? PEDCOR has a total cost of six, 60500000 million five hundred thousand. Add on 62 million lost county tax revenue for 60 years, the total cost is 122 million 500,000. That works out to $9,360 per unit per year for the whole 60 years. That's a far cry from $1,000. Maybe part of the cost will be offset with less maintenance staff since, since you'll have more, more new units. Do they know there will be less of them working? I don't share Paul's concern that residents should have a say in what happens. It's unfortunate, but they live in subsidized housing and they have to live wherever that is located. I, re I agree with Jim that vouchers would give residents the opportunity to move anywhere. Since the county is paying for relocation costs, let's hope they don't all want to move to Florida. Is there a reason the county can't sell all, of it, all their property and use strictly vouchers? Seems that would solve the problem if there are places for the residents to go. There have been news stories that vouchers going unused because there aren't enough vacancies that will accept them. Before this project goes any farther, you should hire outside housing experts to try and find the best solution for this situation. County employees are, I'm sure, wonderful people, 
but I don't think they're experts when it comes to this issue. Thank you. Ken, you wanted to... Yes, please. Um, with respect to the $1,000 per door, speak to, I got the information from our staff who did the calculations on that. You can speak to them about that. Um, <clears throat> I believe the gentleman's name is Chuck, who is, is the uh, lead on that. And, so is uh, that he, for, you, for he, which, that is a current units or future? For the PEDCOR units. That's for the PEDCOR units. Yeah, and it's on property taxes. So talk to him. He'll tell you what the calculations are. With respect to what I said uh, regarding the economy, it's taken out of context. What I said is we have built an economy based on paying as little as we can possibly pay, and we're paying the consequences for that. With respect to corporations, I did not say that they were evil corporations, but I will tell you that many corporations move jobs overseas, and the number one reason that they do so is cheap labor. And that is easily researchable. It's not taxes. It's not even environmental issues. It's cheap labor. That's cost us, because we've built an economy, not just in America, but worldwide, on as cheap a labor as we can get. And the consequence of that decision is people cannot afford their own homes. It's that basic. Well, but court, you say you don't blame corporations, but they're the only ones you called out. I mean, certainly I can think of several other ones right off the top of my head that should be part of the blame. I would, I would suggest the government that gives tax breaks to corporations for moving their businesses overseas would also share some blame. Okay. What about parents that don't keep, teach their kids responsibility or any kind of worth that work ethic? Or the education system that tells kids they can't succeed in life without a college, four-year college degree. So they go to college and come out with $150,000 in debt with some degree in Mesopotamian art that there's no, no job for, and even if there was, they wouldn't pay anything. Well, you don't blame them, or you didn't. True. All right. I could discuss that at length with you. This is probably not the time and place, quite frankly. So if you'd like to have a philosophical discussion on that afterwards, uh, I'd be happy to have that conversation. Well, I just think you should not have just blamed the corporations without putting some of the blame other places. Don. So I ju just uh, um, by way of information, I, I have asked staff to follow up on the query about the uh, the thousand dollars per per door, I received sure. a communication from Mr. Johnson over the weekend, and and have asked staff to follow up with that and other questions that that he had about housing resources. Uh, I don't believe that that has yet to take place, but I will follow up today to make sure that it does. So. Can you make sure we all ask get that? Commissioner Savas mm -hmm. to yes. have a uh, to set up a meeting with uh, Brian Johnson to discuss yes. the. Uh, the units that he has proposed in the past, and I'd like to see how the numbers work on that. Mm -hmm. Can I just say one more quick thing? I'd like to st thank the staff. I mean, I send out emails on the weekends just because I haven't got anything else to do, I guess, <laughs> but I don't expect <laughs> you to answer them on the weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, less. Less is more, I always say. <laughs> Good morning, Les Poole. I live in Clackamas County, and when I send you emails on the weekend, I expect a response. <laughs> <laughs> but if you send me an email on the weekend, I'll try to get back to you by Tuesday. <laughs> um, yeah, it, interesting that we almost missed the, the uh, Pledge of Allegiance because I was going to mention that, you know, today's December 7th, and... I think we should all just take a moment of silence and just be grateful that we weren't there that day and what our grandparents went through. Yeah. Um, I was going to make a couple comments about Oregon City Manor and how we're doing subsidized and affordable housing. And um, that was just covered in a variety of ways. Um, with much more insight or depth than I have. But from, a, from afar, from someone in the, in the audience the last couple of weeks, I'm troubled by some of what I heard about what that property's worth and, and what its issues are. And <coughs> I certainly was troubled to hear that, uh, that buildings built in the 60s can't be refurbished considering they're showing people how to do that on TV every night. So I understand that there's a lot of pressure for higher growth. That's prime property. It is surrounded by new homes. Uh, the developers are calling and knocking on your door as sure as I'm sitting here. So that whole issue needs to be aired out. And uh, when I was here last and, and 
the issue came up. It was a consent agenda item. And I came up and I spoke, and the first thing I said, or one of the early things I said was, that should have been a discussion item. Because here we are halfway through, and, and now the public is showing up. And th there's something not right in that. I see a lack of transparency in the housing side of things. You wear a lot of hats. I don't expect anyone to respond to what I'm saying here because you've got all these departments you're in charge of. And, and that is very tied to the federal bureaucracy. Uh, but the bottom line is there's an incredible amount of money involved there. And how we subsidize or how we help people in need needs to be re-examined. And I'm not asking the county to do that. But I would certainly hope the county would keep that in their minds. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is a couple of weeks ago, I, I brought up again our situation with the roads. Uh, in January, I believe in January, we'll start seeing five cent gas tax uh, coming into the county for road maintenance and where that goes and what we do with that is critical. Um, there's another five cents gas tax that the state will use. So there is a 10 cent gas tax coming in Oregon that came out of the transportation bill. And there isn't enough time to talk about the transportation bill, but there is enough time to say that with a $5 billion bill or a $5 billion uh, 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 transportation budget, we still didn't get any, any money for 205. So the problem with transportation is getting worse. I will be back. I will have more questions. Um, I don't expect you to have all the answers. But that's another discussion that is coming, and coming soon and quickly. So thank you for your time, as always. And I appreciate that, that you're allowing folks to speak over three minutes when it's important issues. Um, and, I, and not that I need to communicate with you, but this might be an opportunity to talk to the rest of the commissioners about uh, uh, a letter that Metro's sending out, which is basically saying that uh, they don't think any money from tolling should pay for uh, enhancing or adding lanes. And so Paul's at the meeting, and uh, yeah. and I totally oppose that idea. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, my, my argument is that Clackamas County, if we were at a level playing field, we had adequate lanes, that would be another story. But to start when we're deficient, in the number of lanes we have at 205 and say we can't use it to expand it makes no sense at all. So I, I, I know uh, I won't be here next week, but I know that um, Paul is gonna suggest that we write a letter in uh, opposing that, and I hope you guys will support that. Oh. And I know he wants to talk to me, I think he'll be here a little late about that, and, and we do oppose that. Uh, then the other thing that you brought up, uh, Oregon City Manor, I went to the community meetings where they invited the folks in. I, I thought it was, uh, it was very open and public, uh, and I think we've had a couple since it. Then, but I, want, I, don't, I don't understand what we're doing here. We are only asking for permission to sell. We haven't actually made a decision to sell, and actually we're working with Oregon City to talk about how could we utilize that property better. And have you ever, as I've been in those facilities. I've been there. I they're, know they're, to live there. Not high quality structures. They were built quickly right. uh, to house people that needed housing, and I don't believe they're on foundations. The other thing is, is that, um, you know, I. I've met and Paul's met and Sonny's going to meet with uh, somebody who does manufactured housing. You know, there may be an opportunity to do something like that, but that isn't the best site for that either. It's, uh, it's very hilly, but there, we have other sites that might be. And uh, so all we're doing is getting the, uh, um, you know, have a chance to consider selling that. And uh, we'll work with Oregon City and other housing advocates to figure out what's the best way to invest that money uh, or reinvest that money on that site. 
So we're working at it. We're good. We good. haven't made. There's anything. options there, and and uh, um, I I am not questioning that money needs to go there, and that that property could be utilized better. No question as to that. But how we get there, and what happens when we are eliminating uh, 50 or 100 homes, and then we have to replace those? That that. Yeah, uh, and now we're getting into a deep discussion for another time but I realize it's complex. Our goal is a four to one ratio for every one we get rid of we replace it with four. Uh, getting the price uh, you know that's reasonable not $245,000 a door that's the challenge. That's where the county's going to have to step up and say we're either not going to charge these fees uh, we're going to own the land and give it to you uh, and stuff like that. That's where the big challenge really is. I know. And now you're back to the county's going to, why don't we just buy the land and for the paper mill? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, there's a point where there's all kinds of options, but there's an economic reality out there, and we all understand that. And, yeah. And the paper mill has, a, you know, environmental challenges, too. It's, it's higher up, though, so it wasn't like the other side washed when the floods every time. Uh, it did get flooded, however. That's what I remember. Uh, but not like the other side was just washed off every so many years. But anyway. All right. Well, thank you for coming today. Um, so we're going to move on to um, the consent agenda. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On our consent agenda under Health, Housing, and Human Services, we have approval of a sub-recipient grant agreement with Clackamas Women's Services for Shelter from Domestic Violence, approval of the 2013 through 2017 carryover report pertaining to intergovernmental agreement number 148058 with the State of Oregon, Department of Human Services, Seniors, and People with Disabilities Division, approval of an interagency agreement with Clackamas County Health Centers Division for the School-Based Health Centers, Building Mental Health Services Capacity for Oregon City and Sandy High Schools, approval of a sub-recipient professional services agreement with Cascade AIDS Project for HIV testing and counseling services. Under our Department of Transportation Development, approval of a public crossing at grade crossing agreement with Union Pacific Railroad Company. Under elected officials, approval of previous business meeting minutes. Under our county council, approval of settlement agreements with Parametrics Inc. for a Carver Bridge litigation. Under technology services, approval of a contract with CDW slash G for procurement of an Exagrid EX280 system for backup storage. Under our development agency, approval of a disposition agreement with Clackamas Crossing LLC. And under Water Environment Services, approval of Amendment Number 1 to the Professional Services Contract between Murray Smith, Inc. and Clackamas County Service District Number 1 for Arowana Pump Station and Hoodland Water Resource Recovery Facility Modernization. And that concludes today's consent agenda. Great. Does any member of the Commission wish to pull an item from the consent agenda? Uh, entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move we approve the consent agenda. Second. Is there a second? Well, I'm going to let you talk after there's a second. Okay. okay. Oh, second. Okay. Right. Yes, Commissioner. <laughs> I was going to let you say On <laughs> item seven, regarding the approval of settlement agreement with parametrics, there is not an attachment. So I don't know. There's supposed to be yeah, an attachment. Yeah, this is work session, but. I've no, there was, there was supposed to be an attachment to this oh. document. I was submitted. I don't compile the board's packet. Is there a question regarding the terms of the settlement agreement? Happy to answer. Well, I, I'm just wanting to review it before I agreed to consent to it, but I don't know if it. Yeah, we had this discussion in work session um, so I have. a couple weeks ago. Uh, executive session, I believe, is what oh, we an had executive a session. Times. So I executive have session. approval of settlement agreements. Yeah, we have that. She has that. Oh, yeah. So, but you on. Wanted the whole agreement in the no, it's. Apparently, Kevin has the oh. settlement agreement. Okay. Um, so, that was my, my only we concern. We wanted the actual 
The, yeah, it was supposed to be attached the to the legal our document. document. Okay. Yeah. And it wasn't right. attached. I don't know if did you guys have it attached to no. yours? No, no, I just have okay. the one piece. So I was just concerned for the public record that the consent agenda was not including the release as the document states. And I just want to make sure that we're being transparent. So is it before we approve it. Otherwise we can pull it and then approve it later after we get it correct in the public record. Is it posted on the web? Yes, Mr. Chair, it is posted online in the web version. Okay, the, the agreement itself. Yes. Okay. okay, and that was my only concern. I recall us going through this. I know the terms of the settlement agreement. I don't have any issues with it. I just wanted to make sure that it is for, for okay. being transparent. All right. Okay. And okay. then I just have one other comment. Can I make uh -huh. a comment? <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to highlight, I don't want to remove an item, but I want to highlight the mental health services in the schools at Sandy High School and Oregon City High School. We are consenting to those resources. Going there, and this just highlights we had a wonderful meeting with our superintendents to talk about how we can work with our school districts, and this is one example of how we are working with our school districts, and I expect we will see many future collaborations to come. You know, you actually picked out the two items I was going to comment on. Oh. Uh, <laughs> one is the, is the Carver Bridge, which this is the next step, and God willing, uh, We'll, we'll next spring, we'll finish this project up. I know a lot of people would like to see it happen. Uh, it actually took longer than it took to build the Selwood Bridge. So uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's nice to have that behind us. And then Clackamas Women's Services, uh, some money to uh, uh, emergency food and shelter program. Uh, I think this is just a, you know, what a great partner they've been. And we continue to work with them. Uh, and this this uh, is actually an agreement for only twenty one thousand dollars. I don't think we could uh, make a better investment uh, than the great work that Clackamas Women's Services provides. So I just thought that's the other one I'd highlight. So excellent. Anyway, so with that, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Hearing none. Motion carries. Great. So now we're on to. Uh, County Administrator updates. Yeah, I've got a couple of items for you. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that last week here at our uh, Red Soils campus, our Department of Transportation and Development uh, Department hosted the Oregon Road Scholar Program, which is sponsored by the Oregon Department of Transportation. The program relays the latest information on road maintenance procedures and technologies to the folks who uh, participate uh, in that. And I'm happy to report that the event was quite successful and we had some 33 of our own transportation maintenance employees able to participate. I mean, we usually don't have the uh, opportunity to be able to have such a high level of participation for what is uh, an annual event. So I just uh, wanted to say thanks um, to our transportation and development staff for hosting the event and creating an opportunity for more of our staff to uh, learn and, uh, and uh, be better able to serve the public. Uh, I also wanted to make a mention, if you get the opportunity uh, to visit our uh, Riverstone Clinic uh, near the Clackamas Town Center off of the 82nd, uh, because we have a beautiful new art project uh, there. The clinic, of course, uh, offers walk-in services for individuals and families with urgent behavioral health uh, needs. And the photography project that we have is called uh, Hello Neighbor, and it helps participants uh, learn photography skills and to build relationships. The final products of all of that are large-scale portraits with uh, participant quotes that go along with it. And the portraits are really quite striking. Uh, one of the quotes for one of them, for example, says, I am so inspired by the people who work here. They are true believers that recovery is possible for anyone. So I'd invite you to take an opportunity to, to drop by and see them. Finally, I, uh, I wanted to let you know about the follow-up uh, uh, with a Mr. Tony King, uh, who lives off of Rusk Road. He was here last week talking about his concerns about uh, flooding on his property. We did get him connected up uh, with uh, 
our disaster management director, Nancy Bush, who has uh, been working with him and continues to work uh, with him. One of the issues related to his uh, challenges in, in being able to be eligible for buyout program is he actually lives within the city limits of the city of Milwaukee. So we are working with city of Milwaukee wow. folks to try to connect up and see if there's a way over the long run to be able to address his uh, specific needs. In the meantime, Nancy's been able to uh, get he and him and his, uh, his uh, wife uh, connected up with other services that the county offers and provides uh, folks that are facing th these kinds of difficult circumstances. So we'll continue to do that for him. Wanted to let you know we followed up. Great, thank you. First up would be Ken. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Well, it's been an eventful week. Uh, had the opportunity with Commissioner Savas to go out to the Mount Hood community and have a town hall meeting with some of the folks out there where we had some discussions regarding roads and development that's, that uh, is of interest to the folks out there and share some of our activities um, here in Clackamas County down here. I like to call it the Puzzle Palace sometimes <laughs> with some of the things that we're doing. Um, I went to the Oregon Leadership Summit uh, this week uh, also attended the Mount Hood Chamber Volunteer uh, Breakfast with the rest of my colleagues where we served breakfast to, what, 100, 120 of the volunteers that, uh, that really make up uh, the backbone of that community. And uh, then attended the Artistic Minds event at Parrot Creek the other night uh, where some of the young men who um, uh, have been taught some basic artist or, or, or artistic skills uh, presented some of their work. Um, which was a very nice reception for them. And then I wanted to uh, kind of put an idea out on um, our flooding issues with some of the properties that are in flood zones. And the thought I had, or actually I didn't have it, but a citizen had it at the, at a, um, at the meeting up there on Mount Hood, and that is, could we have considered the idea of a land bank of properties that we end up having to foreclose on for one reason or another. It could then be available for swaps with people that are in flood zones but where we don't necessarily have the buyout uh, capabilities. We would be able to get that land um, into the public ownership and get houses off of it where we don't have to rebuild homes that get flooded and we have a property that we could offer that, that resident. Um, so j just a thought that, uh, that a citizen came up with that I thought might be a workable idea. I know we don't get a lot of, of foreclosures and staff work very hard to work people through those foreclosures, but when we get them, that might be uh, at least one small way that we could uh, work on that flooding problem on occasion. So I'll leave it at that and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dogs, do you have a dog or anything today? No, no dog. dogs today, they have all been adopted. Merry Christmas to wow. the puppies. <laughs> I know I check every week. Commissioner Fisher. <clears throat> so it's, it's getting colder outside. It's the holiday season. I just want to highlight for everyone that our warming shelters were open yep. for service. And I want to uh, say thank you to my fellow commissioners for moving forward with our declaring a housing emergency so that our staff could move quickly to address the cold outside. And along with winter comes the holidays. I took the opportunity to visit the Helmig tree farm in Malala, got a tour of the farm, talked about the Christmas tree shortage, saw a lot of trees that were packed and ready to be exported across the country to Arizona and really got a sense when you meet with these uh, tree farmers, it's a family business, it's in the family for generations, and it's a very large industry for Clackamas County. We, um, for Clackamas County alone, it's $29 million industry, so it's one to pay attention to, it's very important, and I just wanna thank the Helmig family for sharing with me. Helen, who's six years old, uh, toured with us with her nice pink ribbon and enjoyed decorating the different Christmas trees that we that we got to see. And if folks want to see pictures of that, they're on my Commissioner Fisher Facebook page. Please visit that at com Facebook. And I don't know the actual address, but it's if you look for Commissioner Fisher, F-I-S-C-H-E-R, you can see some of those pictures, beautiful pictures of the tree farm. And then lastly, I just want to again thank my fellow commissioners. We have had a very busy week, and I attended most all events with Commissioner Humberston, so I won't go into all of it. But I tell you, when we were there 
at Mount Hood, <laughs> and we had our hats and our aprons, and we were serving the volunteers, it just struck me that we have a commission that serves, we care, and we are there to uh, solve problems and meet the needs of our community. So again, thank you, it's an honor to be here. Great, thank you. Commissioner uh, C. Schneider. <laughs> <laughs> Behave. Um, in any case, yeah, actually the Mount Hood Chamber breakfast was a lot of fun and I wanted, just want to mention and we carpooled uh, Commissioner Fisher and I. So we are trying to be efficient with, uh, with how we get to places. <laughs> and it was a beautiful drive up because as you know, it is cold out. Uh, thank goodness for the warming centers, but it was a beautiful, uh, in that case, the view of the mountain, uh, the snow, the whole uh, ambiance of the beauty of this county, and uh, that I always like to remind people that a good portion of Mount Hood is in Clackamas County. And, um, you know, we have a great tourism opportunity there. Ski resorts are open, but it was a beautiful day to drive up to the mountain. I also attended the Oregon Leadership Summit with my colleagues, and I also serve, as I mentioned a little while ago, on the Workforce Board in Clackamas County. And uh, there were futurists there speaking about what is going to be the future of workforce because of automation. So what we're going to have to think about as we move forward with workforce skill sets, what does that mean? What kind of skills do people mean? There are certain things that robots can't do. So how do we interface with a new skill set for the 21st century so people can have jobs and worthwhile jobs and jobs that give them meaning um, with this umbrella of mechan mechanization, including things like cars that we don't have to drive anymore, but we're still gonna need the roads for. So a uh, very interesting discussion and a lot of good literature on that. Um, also that evening, uh, we, also, we had a dinner. The Association of Oregon Counties met with the folks, the Oregon Business Council, um, we usually have a dinner at this event every year where the counties and the Oregon Community Foundation and the business groups get together to talk about uh, county policies, statewide policies, what we need to be doing for jobs and workforce. And I think, um, I think Jim, you were, you were supposed to be there, but I think Commissioner Savas went in your stead for this one. So that was, um, that was very informative because it's, it's a, it was a combination of the three key sectors and that is philanthropy, the business community, the government, so public, private, and nonprofit. And that's how we get things done in this county uh, and in this country. The other meeting I had was with the Oregon China Sister State Relations Council, my friends, and I'm happy to announce that the e-commerce platform for our business community is up in Tingen uh, uh, province. They have a free trade zone. Um, I've asked our economic development team to do a beta test with it. It enables Oregon businesses, small, medium, large, to ship product to the free trade zone and actually, uh, actually have it viewed by folks directly uh, at a pavilion that is specifically dedicated to Oregon and um, see if we can get some uh, more direct contact with people selling their goods and services uh, overseas to our China neighbors. The Oregon China Sister State Relations Council has been, um, is a volunteer group. It has been sanctioned by the state of Oregon to work on relationships, trade relationships with, uh, with China specifically, and I'm privileged to serve on that board. Um, because it is her Pearl Harbor Day, um, I just wanted to mention something that, uh, a story that I'll never forget when I was door knocking one day uh, in my forays into being a county commissioner, um, I went to this little kind of house that was very modest and I knocked on the door and a veteran came to the door, a World War II veteran, and he was very modest and he must have been in his 80s and just kind of a fun elderly man. And he said, oh yeah, I was at Pearl Harbor. And I was like, what? He goes, yep, it was just amazing how he said, he said, one minute I was on a boat, next minute I was in the water. And the way he said it was very matter of fact, he survived, he swam to where he needed to be, but it was real striking to me how the greatest generation really um, 
You know, they just went out there and did their duty. And for him, oh well. He was on the boat, in the water. He was able to get out. He did see some of his colleagues, you know. I mean, that was a, that was a dastardly act in a, in a terrible situation. But so it is good for us to remember today uh, the sacrifices and the, the way the greatest generation has shouldered their responsibilities is something that I think we as a county, nation, state need to emulate again. And I'm hopeful we can keep moving in that direction. So Jim, with that, I'm gonna give you the arts because I've talked too much already. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so I also wanted to mention Pearl Harbor, 8 a.m. December 7th, 1941. Uh, Franklin Roosevelt said this will live, in, uh, will live in infamy. And uh, I had an opportunity about a year and a half ago to actually meet one of the survivors of the Arizona, USS Arizona. Uh, I, I'm sure they have a freedom to go out there whenever they have a chance. And, and I had an opportunity to talk to him uh, 2,400 people died, 1,000 injured. And there were, as of July, five survivors still alive from the USS Arizona. So um, I had an opportunity to visit our Judge Leininger in court and watch her uh, process through about six kids, uh, some of them setting trial dates, some of them uh, being released, uh, some of them going to Parrot Creek and other facilities around, some of them going back to Donnelly Long, uh, which is not a place you want to stay too long. But uh, I, I text, uh, texted Ann this morning, I said that what, what always hits me when you go into those courts is that it's a hell of a lot easier to just stay out of trouble. It's a lot of work to get back on the right path but boy, I mean, some of these kids, 18 months, years, sometimes three or four failures, and uh, at some point they decide, well, it's just easier uh, to go the right path. And anyway, I thought Ann did a great job. Um, the judge did a great job. Um, uh, I think that uh, she's, she'll be a great replacement for Judge Darling. And... Uh, Look forward to visiting her again. Maybe one of the, her tr actual trials would be interesting. Also, Mount Hood Chamber Breakfast. I think Connie Scott does a great job getting folks together to do that breakfast. It's, uh, it's one of those really fun things we do as commissioners. Uh, and it was a lot of fun, uh, you know, serving food to, to all those folks. And uh, flood zone, Rusk Road. You know, I've lived in, I lived in Milwaukee my whole life. Fl uh, Rusk Road has been flooding my whole life. Uh, I mean, uh, it's always been a, a problem. I think that years ago when they built that dam the gentleman talked about, it, it did reduce flooding uh, for, for a number of years. But if you actually look that way up at Happy Valley and you see how they, in many cases, scraped the hillsides and built all those homes. Uh, it, there's bound to be this huge problem, and I don't know how you, you prevent flooding in that area. We have a piece of land that is under the Parks District where that uh, reservoir is, where that berm is, and if, if you have a chance, go back and take a look at that site. I've walked through it. Um, it's, it's very challenging to resolve. I don't know that you ever will. Believe me, it's, flood, it's been flooding since, since I was a kid. Uh, I think Sonia was, was up first. Yes. Oh. I was just going to comment. One of the things they do in Arizona where they have um, um, you know, torrential rainfalls that uh, cause a lot of uh, flooding in very specific areas, usually kind of big washes and gullies and things. As many, in many of the communities, they make parks out of them. Mm -hmm. They yeah. don't allow houses to be built in them in the first place. And that way, yeah, you may get a flood and it may wipe out the grass or some trees or even some picnic tables or something like that, but it doesn't ruin people's homes. We actually have that in or the, the, the more library that we could do, the better. Happy Valley mm -hmm. is a park that is... Uh, 
catch basin for water. Yeah. We do do that. But, you know, these, these homes have been there since I was uh, born. And, and you know, so we, that was, what, 30 years. As we go forward, if we, uh, and, and we can get people out of those properties, if we're able to get people out of those properties, that might be a, yeah. a way to resolve some of it. So. Yeah, and you know, when, and when uh, FEMA does give us the monies to buy property, we did a number of those on the Sandy River, uh, no one can ever build a home there again. Right. Home's taken down and it becomes public uh, property. And uh, the, the problem is it has to almost be a big enough flood for FEMA to come in and provide the money to do it. Beaver Creek flooded a few years ago, and we uh, we bought out some of those properties. I remember that. And then there's some people, of course, don't want to sell. Everybody likes to live on the water till it decides it wants to move where they are. That's right. <laughs> well, with that, I'm going to read the arts and culture activities in the county. The poem Pigeon, Love Poems Book Launch, uh, presented by Milwaukee Poetry Series and Poetry Box, the Poming Pigeon, not a <laughs> Sorry, it's pigeon, arts. <laughs> pigeon, is a semi-annual <laughs> journal of poverty with, with each book oh, poetry. of poetry. Gosh. Poetry. poetry. <laughs> ESL? Jim, read it. Jim okay, is this right, ESL? Okay. <laughs> okay, a semi-annual journal of poetry with each book having a unique theme. Get some more coffee, Jim. The sixth <laughs> issue will be the Poming Pigeon. Love poems. Saturday, December 9th, 2 to 4 p.m. <laughs> at the Pond House, adjacent to the Letting Library in Milwaukee. Wilsonville Stage presents A Christmas Pudding. This play is a delightful, nostalgic comedy for the holidays, an evening to stir memories and share laughter in the great bond of our holiday season. Friday and Saturday, December 8th and 9th at Meridian United Church of Christ. Wednesday, December 13th at St. Francis Episcopal Church Parish Hall. Uh, Friday and Saturday, December 15th and 16th at Wilsonville Community Center. And Monday and Tuesday, December 18th and 19th at the Charbonneau Clubhouse. 7.30 p.m. curtain for all shows. For more information about arts in Clackamas County, go to ClackamasArtsAlliance.org. That's well, because those, you get up so those early nuns in the morning. did not hit me hard enough on my hands. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do actually. Uh, some, something's been waking me at about three fifteen for the past week, and I don't know what it is. But no, that's it problem. could be the fact that I have no walls in my house, <laughs> and, and the floors have big holes in them. Hmm. Well, I don't know if you've done any remodeling lately. But to get a contractor to show up, we're working on the same. You know, thing. it's awful. I mean, July is when we were supposed to start. Now, then they show up for three weeks. They gut the portion of the house, cut leave? the floor out, start a cement wall, and leave for two months. And they say they need nice weather. Uh, <laughs> They were supposed to be in on Monday to, with the nice weather to pour a concrete wall. Have you seen them? We started our bathroom remodel in April. It's still not done. Oh, such first world yes, problems. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I had, a, you know, in our old 1910 farmhouse, the, you know, the ceiling fell in on us once. I mean, that was glorious. Lath and plaster was detaching. Okay. I just thought, I kept hearing these weird, odd little creaky sounds. It was the it was a ceiling. Well, with oh, that, glorious. stay warm, <laughs> and uh, we're adjourned.